You know, Kenwell. Yeah? I have been looking forward to this show. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think there's something very special about the circle. Really? Oh, yes. Circles are very interesting. Uh-huh. In fact, they are mystical. Oh. <laughs> Did you know that every civilization is thought of the circle as something kind of sacred? Really? Mm-hmm. Well... Did you know that the First, First Nations... Nations people actually used the circle? And First I was there was the medicine say... wheel, and then there was the sun dance that was done on the prairies in a sacred circle. Right, and did you know Oh, that... and you know, I found a plan of an ancient Greek temple. Well, wait a second. I thought Greek temples were rectangular. Not all of them. Some of them were completely circular. Well, and the Greeks were really... In fact, you know, I think that every culture dating back to the Stone Age was interested in the circle in some way. You know, because of their power... Christine, kinda... Christine, I think Euclid's having a hairball. What? <laughs> wow. Stonehenge. <laughs> Nicely done, Euclid. Now that is a circle. Well, strictly speaking, Stonehenge isn't a circle. A real circle... A nice one. Euclid just coughs up Stonehenge and you want to get technical. Hi, you're watching Math Shop, where we make the elusive mysteries of Mathematica solid as a rock. I'm Christine, and this is my Math Shop partner and geometry genius, Ken Wall. I can talk now? Hmm? Hello. That's it? Yeah. Hmm. And this is my well-rounded and slightly egocentric computer, Euclid. Today, we're going to talk about the geometry of the circle. We'll define chords, tangents, secants, rays, and arcs. And we'll conduct a number of investigations into their properties using Euclid. That fits. After all, much of what we'll introduce in this show was first defined by Euclid. Yeah. Uh, no, the first Euclid, the Greek mathematician, he recorded a lot of circle geometry in the first 13 chapters of his textbook called Elements, way back in the fourth century BC. Hmm. Yeah, well, he's history, isn't it? My Euclid circle software is state of the art. All right, then he can do a basic review of geometry for us. No problem. Euclid? The basic unit of geometry is called a point. It's plotted on a plane. There are an infinite number of points on the plane. And any two of these points can be used to draw a line. And a line goes on forever in both directions. We show that with arrows. Any two points can also be used as endpoints to determine a segment. A segment has a starting point and an ending point. However, if a set of points has only one end point, it is called a ray. We indicate a ray by drawing a line with an arrow on one end. Here, the points AB define a segment. But A is also the end point of a ray, as is B. Two points can also define a circle. One defines the center of the circle, and the other determines the distance from the center to the edge of the circle. Segments that join two points on a circle are called chords. If a chord runs through the center of the circle, it is called a diameter. It's also the longest possible chord in any circle. Any line that travels through a circle and intersects it at two points is called a secant. If, on the other hand, a line intersects the circle at only one point, it's called a tangent. Any segment that joins the center of a circle to a point on the circle is called a radius. Lastly, any portion of the circle is called an arc. In this example, arc PQ is that section of the circle between points P and Q. Great review, Christine, but your state-of-the-art wonder boy forgot to cover some basics. Don't be so sarcastic. He's very sensitive. Okay, okay, I'll be gentle. 
First of all, he forgot to mention that the arc of an entire circle measures 360 degrees. Okay, minor point. Okay, and then the measure of half a circle or a semicircle is 180 degrees. Yeah, well, that makes sense. What else? And it's important to remember why we study circles in geometry. We're waiting with bated breath. Oh, well, okay. I've got a list here. I mean, circles are important in the study of astronomy, architecture, surveying, engineering, aerospace engineering, microwave engineering, in the construction of satellite dishes. It's important for machinists, optometrists, yeah, urban... Yeah, okay, okay, I got you. Circle geometry is very important for practical uses. Right, and if I'm going to teach about circles, um, Euclid's rock pile will have to go. Rock pile? Mm -hmm. This is much more than just a pile of rocks, Canwall. In fact, this used to be an ancient way of calculating astronomical events. And don't forget our topic for today, okay? Circles, this is a circle. No, it isn't a circle. It's a circle. Well, stone and is circular. But if you look at it closely, the shape is rather irregular. Yeah, well, so what? Well, in mathematics, we deal with the geometry of perfect circles. I mean, this display is rather impressive, but it is not a circle. All right. Euclid, would you mind deep six in the rocks? Oh, thank you. And now, let me demonstrate our first investigation, how to find the center of a circle. First, we need a circle. So I'm going to use this and draw a circle. Now, if I needed to find the exact center of the circle, how would I do it? Well, I could guess. Maybe here, or here, or perhaps here. It's not very accurate. In order to achieve that accuracy, I need to use some tools, such as a compass, a straight edge, a protractor, or even a computer. Now, if you don't have a Euclid, you can use these tools to accurately draw a geometric figure. It's called performing a construction. To perform this construction, we'll need a cord. No, not quite. Remember, a cord is a segment that has its endpoints resting on the circle. So I join them. Now, let's call this cord A. If I bisect this cord with a perpendicular line, it will form a right angle at the point of intersection. Let me do that right now. So I'll use a compass, and with center A, I draw an arc. With the same radius, center B, I draw an arc. Now, where the two arcs meet, I join them. This is called a perpendicular bisector. The bisector passes through the midpoint of the cord. The bisector will also pass through the center of the circle. But it's still not clear where the center is. I still need to bisect another cord. So I join these two points. Let's call it cord X, Y. I'll bisect it with a perpendicular line again. Compass, draw two arcs, same radius, center X. Now, once again, where the two arcs meet, I join them. The center of the circle is found where the two bisectors cross at the point C. This applies to any two chords within a circle, no matter where you draw them on the circle. Euclid, take it from here. Watch what happens when we move the chords around the circle. They still bisect one another at the circle's midpoint. So now I can state a rule. The perpendicular bisectors of any two chords will intersect at the center of the circle. We've just seen how you can find the center of any circle by drawing perpendicular bisectors through any two chords. 
but there's also a relationship between the center of a circle and a perpendicular to a tangent. Let's see how that works. Okay, Euclid, let's do the secant investigation. We'll start with a secant called xy. Remember, a secant is a line that passes through a circle, so it has two points of intersection. And that part of a secant which is contained on and inside a circle is a chord. Now, if I bisect the chord segment of this secant, I expect that bisector to travel through the center of the circle. And it does. But suppose I now move the secant closer and closer to the edge of the circle. Notice that the bisector still forms a 90 degree angle with the secant, but the points x and y are getting closer and closer together. If I continue to move the secant, eventually the two points at which the secant intersects the circle become one. This is now, by definition, a tangent, because it intersects a circle at only one point. This is called the point of tangency. So, a perpendicular line drawn through the point of tangency always passes through the circle center. And just as we did with the two chords, you could also use two tangents to find the center of a circle. Since we're talking about tangents, there's another interesting feature we can look at. If you construct any two tangents on the same circle, eventually they'll intersect, unless, of course, they're parallel. The two segments formed by the point of intersection of the tangents and the points at which the tangents intersect the circle will always be equal. One tangent intersects the circle at point P and the other at point R. They intersect at point S. Euclid, please measure the length of segment PS and segment RS. And we find that they're the same. In fact, no matter where these tangents intersect the circle, the two segments, PS and RS, will always be equal. Watch. Euclid, animate, please. Again, the only time this principle doesn't apply is when the two tangents are parallel. The principle we just investigated states, two intersecting tangents form segments of equal length. So far, we've been looking at circles and line segments, but there are some interesting properties of circles and triangles too. I'm going to use a circle geoboard to do this. Now, here's a circle which has a triangle inside it. These three vertices are part of the circle and one side of the triangle forms the circle's diameter. All three angles are called inscribed angles because they are contained within the circle, with each vertex resting on the circle itself. In such a situation where one side of the triangle is the diameter, the angle across from that side will always be equal to 90 degrees. Let's measure it. Yes, it is 90. Now, watch what happens if I move this vertex around the circle. So I move it here, and this angle is also 90 degrees. The angle doesn't change. It always remains 90 degrees. So we could state the principle like this. An inscribed triangle whose one side forms the diameter of a circle always has one angle equal to 90 degrees. As a matter of fact, if you add up the other two angles, they also add up to 90 degrees. And lastly, if you add up all the angles of any triangle, they always add up to 180 degrees, a property of all triangles. Let's look at another construction now involving angles within a circle. Euclid, could we have a central angle and an inscribed angle, please? In this situation, we have one inscribed angle, angle A, and one central angle, angle B. Angle B is called a central angle because its vertex is also the center of the circle. They share the same two points on the circle, points P and Q, and contain the same arc, arc PQ. Let's measure the two angles and see if we can determine the relationship between the inscribed angle and the central angle.
notice that angle B is twice the measure of angle A. When we rotate point A around the circle, angle B is still twice that of angle A. In fact, no matter where we position angle A outside the common arc, the relationship is the same. The central angle is always twice the measure of the inscribed angle. So here's another rule we found in our investigations. A central angle is twice the measure of an inscribed angle when they contain the same chord or arc. You know, there's another property of circles in the last example that's just a point away. Just a point away? Yeah. Euclid, just show us that last graphic again. Okay, take the center point and drag it to the edge of the circle. Right there. That's a cyclic quadrilateral. A cycle what? Cyclic quadrilateral. The polygon inside the circle has four sides. So it's called the quadrilateral, a four-sided figure. Wait, don't tell me. And because all its vertices rest on the circle, it's called cyclic. Right, but can you guess the special property it has? Sure. It's impossible to spell. Come on, look at it. Do you see anything special? Hmm. Well, maybe, but I'd like to investigate a little. Euclid, measure all the angles. Ah, there's something there, I think. But let's change it and measure the angles again. Good idea. A lot can be discovered through experimentation. Euclid, move the vertices around and measure the angles again. I got it. Look at the angles opposite one another. Euclid, add angle A and angle B. See, they add up to 180 degrees. Does that finding hold for the other two angles, Euclid? Wow, I think we have our next principle of circle geometry, Canwall. Right. Opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 degrees. This is a really interesting property of circles. Let me show you how to prove this property. We already know that the central angle is twice the inscribed angle. As in this case, if the inscribed angle is x, then the central angle is 2x. Likewise, if the inscribed angle is y, then the central angle is 2y. We know by definition that the measure of these two central angles will add up to 360 degrees. So we could use a little algebra here to show that 2x plus 2y is equal to 360 degrees. Now, if I divide both sides of this equation by 2, I get x plus y is equal to 180 degrees, which proves our property that the opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 degrees. Time out, Canwall. This is getting just a little dry, don't you think? What are you doing? First it was Stonehenge, then it was architecture, and now it is... Hockey. Hockey? What goes on in that mind of yours? Come on, Canwall, play along. It's all got to do with circles, I promise you. Okay, now this is the goal, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm in goal, and I'm facing wrist shots, backhands, slap shots. They're coming at me like crazy. It's brutal, but... Suppose that all the people shooting at the goal have to shoot from the perimeter of the circle. Where did you learn to play hockey? Hmm? My mom. You don't get it, do you? No. Well, I'll get you to draw a little picture. Euclid, hockey scenario, please. It's a hypothetical situation where the goal line forms a chord on an imaginary circle. Here's my question. Is there any point on the circle where they have a better angle on goal? Do they shoot from out here, straight on, or come in close and shoot from the side of the net? If you're the shooter, what's your best strategy? Most people would probably say player B. Right, you'll see the most net from straight on. It seems obvious. Well, maybe not. Let me show you the problem again. If three hockey players line up on a circle and shoot from any point on that circle, will any of them have a scoring advantage? Euclid, give me a geometric rendering, please. 
In this situation, I have three inscribed triangles that share a common chord, which is that segment of the goal line between the two goal posts. The length of this chord is kept constant, but here's the interesting part. No matter where the players line up on the circle, the angle formed by the other two sides is always the same measure. Ah, so in theory, each player should score a similar number of goals from different positions on the circle. You got it. Wait a minute, the angle is still the same, but as the shooter moves around the circle towards the side of the net, the target gets smaller. Yes, you're right. But those with a smaller target are also closer to the net. No matter where you stand on the circle, the accuracy required to get the puck in the net is the same. You still have to control the accuracy of your shot within the exact same angle. So the geometric principle is inscribed angles containing the same chord or arc are equal. We have one more property of circles to demonstrate. It involves an inscribed triangle and a tangent. Does it have anything to do with hockey? Uh, nothing. It's pure geometry. You click. I need a circle, an inscribed triangle, A, B, C, good. And now draw a tangent through B. Lovely. The angle formed by one side of the triangle, in this case, chord B, C, and the tangent, is always equal to the inscribed angle formed by the other two sides. Now let's measure the other external angle formed by side AB and the tangent and compare it to the measure of the inscribed angle formed by the other two sides. They are equal as well. No matter where the vertices of the inscribed triangle are located on the circle, this principle applies. Watch. Euclid, animate please. So, the principle states, the angle formed by one side of an inscribed triangle and a tangent is always equal to the inscribed angle formed by the other two sides. Now, if I've counted right, we've covered nine different principles of circle geometry. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. I think a summary is in yeah. order. Yep. Thanks, Kenwell. Appreciate it. Uh. Oops. Come here, Euclid. All right. Euclid, summarize, please. The perpendicular bisectors of any two chords will intersect at the center of a circle. Likewise, a perpendicular line drawn through the point of tangency always passes through the circle's center. Next, Two intersecting tangents form segments of equal length. An inscribed triangle whose one side forms the diameter of a circle always has one angle equal to 90 degrees. And remember that the three angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. A central angle is twice the measure of an inscribed angle containing the same chord or arc. And when we change that graphic to form a cyclic quadrilateral, we found our next property of circles, which is opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 degrees. Then we did our hockey investigation, which demonstrated that inscribed angles containing the same chord or arc are equal. Lastly, the angle formed by one side of an inscribed triangle and a tangent is always equal to the inscribed angle formed by the other two sides. That's a lot to memorize. Yes, it is. But I have a special technique to help you remember these properties. Because they're predominantly visual, it's a good idea to draw a picture of each property. Well, I'm from Missouri, so you better show me. Well, here it is a visual display of all the properties on a simple sheet of paper. Neat. 
Each of these properties are stated in a clear and concise fashion and are accompanied by a simple drawing. It's a great way to remember and to study. It's great. I love it. Okay, well, let's say our goodbyes. I'm going to get some practice in. Okay. Bye. See you next time on The Math Shop. Goodbye. <laughs> what do you call your team again? The Vicious Circles. The Vicious Circles? Yeah, it scares the heck out of the competition. Why? Well, you know, we've all been in relationships. Uh, uh, here, let me take some shots. Good. All right, don't spare me. Ooh! Oh, that's Save, good. save! Oh, I got one in! Okay, it's get the ready, only get one ready, you're get ready. In. Oh. oh, that was good. Okay. Oh, oh that was good. Keep your, keep your uh, pads together. All right, Kim, well. Oh. oh, that was a good save. You're aiming awfully high. I'm not Gump Worsley, you know. Oh, that was a good reflection. Oh, oh another reflection. <laughs> Reflection. <laughs>